Investigation Methods July 18th, 1979 It's not unusual for a Tamma practitioner who traverses the path to the cessation of Dukkha to encounter problems that arise from practice, with the only exception of a Kippa Pinya, one who becomes enlightened quickly. But for you ordinary practitioners, there will be problems to solve. You'll have to muster all of your mental resources to solve them. Your mind will be spinning like a tammatzakka or wheel of tamma. When you're developing banya, this is the way it will be. In developing samadhi, you'll have to use sati to control and subdue the jitta. When there is no sati to control it, the jitta will ceaselessly think and conjure up images to deceive you, although they are just shadows. The producer of these images is inside the jitta, but the shadows are projected outward to fool you to become obsessed with them. This will happen to every practitioner. If you don't know this fact, then your jitta will never calm down. You should therefore always watch your jitta with sati. Then, when it begins to conjure, you'll feel that there is something emerging. But you usually won't know this because it only emerges when you're not mindful. You'll only realize it after it has already conjured up these images. By then, you'll already become deluded with them. They are merely shadows. All of your conceptualizing is created by Sankara that keeps on conjuring up thoughts and images without end. You then become deluded and obsessed with them by creating more thoughts and images. You might think that you're sitting meditating, but actually you're being obsessed with your thoughts because you're not watching your jitta where your thoughts and images are created. Sati is not watching, so how can the jitta find any calm? You should always keep this in mind. This is the way it really is. It has already happened to me, so I really know it. If it hadn't, how could I tell you? When you're developing calm, you must focus your mindfulness at the jitta where your agitated and restless thoughts are being generated. Sati is a mental factor that functions as a watcher. You should develop it to watch the jitta where all your thoughts and mental images are created. You must not speculate or theorize, you must experience it. Just concentrate your awareness right at the jitta to see what the jitta is generating. If you use a mantra as your concentrating device, then you should be solely aware of your mantra whilst keeping on reciting the mantra. This kind of sankara or mental concoction is not samudaya but magga because it doesn't make you restless or agitated but it makes you calm. It'll curb your thoughts and imaginings that make you restless and agitated. Tamma doesn't make you restless and agitated, but your thoughts on worldly matters will. This kind of sankara or mental concoction is samudaya. No matter how much it concocts, it'll never stop or be contented. It will keep on thinking and deceiving you, both day and night, without any beneficial result. If you're seeking benefit, you should develop your sati to be firmly embedded in your mind by concentrating your attention at your mantra if you choose it as a device to calm your mind. After you have developed some calm, you should begin investigating with banya the 32 parts of the body, or roba, or investigating the feelings, or vedana, that can be sulka, dukkha, or neutral, of the heart and of the body. Keep on investigating with the methods that work for you until you become enlightened. When the jitta calms down, the kilesas will all gather inside and all cravings will temporarily disappear. This state of calm will serve as your base camp where you'll rest, recuperate, and plan your next move. Without calm, you'll always be restless, agitated, and disturbed by what you see, hear, or think. This is the way of feeding your heart with the poisons of dukkha, worries, and anxieties. After you've rested enough and emerged from this state of calm, you should then investigate with banya the external body, either the body of a man, a woman, or an animal, and compare it with your body. They are similar in nature. They are filthy or particula. They are repulsive or asubha, they are impermanent or anitsang, and they get old, get sick, and die. This is true with everybody. The jitta should ceaselessly investigate with banya. Sati, which is indispensable like household medicine, must be ever-present. Sati must accompany every task like the development of calm or samatha, and the development of insight or vipassana. If sati is not directing your investigation, then it will turn into speculation or sanya. In the beginning stages, your investigation will generally be sanya, or speculation, because you haven't yet experienced the result of your investigation. To achieve results, you have to rely on sati to continually direct your investigation until you see the true nature of the object under investigation. 
Only then will sanya turn into panya and eventually become entirely panya. Sanya will then disappear. From then on, your practice will be smooth sailing. It's rather difficult in the beginning stage of your practice, either in developing calm or banya, but you shouldn't let this difficulty block your path. The reason why you can't exert at full capacity is because of your fear of difficulty. You're weak and lazy and won't make any progress. Your heart is filled with interest for mundane matters that by now you should see as harmful. You've engaged with these worldly activities from your childhood days and should see the damage done to you by thinking of them now. You're now striving to emancipate yourselves from the Gelesas with your Tamma practice. You should therefore concentrate all of your efforts into this task. Your exertion will be futile if there is no Sati directing it. Sati is indispensable for both walking and sitting meditation. You must always have sati when you meditate for calm or banya. Sati must always oversee your meditation practice. If you haven't achieved any result yet, it's because you have very little or no sati at all. What's the reason for this lack of sati? It's because you're not putting enough effort into continually developing sati to grow to its full potential. Similarly with developing banya, in the beginning stages it's an uphill struggle because you haven't yet seen what banya can do. When you do, you'll be so hooked and absorbed in your investigation that it can turn into uttacha, or restlessness, one of the higher fetters or sangyodhana, because you get carried away. Uttacha is the jitta's obsession with its investigation. This uttacha is not the uttacha of the five mental hindrances that an ordinary, unenlightened person experiences, or the consequence of thinking about the affairs of the world. Rather, it is the result of relentlessly investigating with banya to reveal that the lakana, or the three characteristics inherent in all conditioned phenomena. Sati and banya, when fully developed, will be ever-present and relentless with their investigation from the very first moment that you arise from your sleep. I had never speculated that it would be like this until it actually happened to me. From the first to the last moment of my waking hours, I was never off guard or absent-minded. Listen to that. This is how Sati and Banya can become, functioning automatically all the time. How then can you ever be off guard? For you have now attained the level of automatic Sati and Banya. During the time of the Lord Buddha, this is called Maha Sati and Maha Banya. Dhanajan Man always exhorted his students to develop their Sati and Banya to become Maha Sati and Maha Banya. He would say, How else can you compete with the deception of the Gelesas that have accumulated in your heart for aeons and countless existences? Your heart is entirely filled with these very powerful Gelesas, leaving no room for the Thamma at all. If your Sati and Banya aren't up to par, how can you subdue and vanquish the Gilesas? To eliminate the Gilesas completely, it's therefore vital to develop Sati and Banya to become more powerful than the Gilesas. Dan Dan Man would always forcefully exhort his students, for he was a man of fortitude and determination, bold and courageous, nimble and efficient. He would teach in a straightforward, honest, and sincere manner, and was always smarter than the Gilesas. Whatever kind of trick the Gilesas might have up their sleeves, he would always know how to outdo them with his wit and skill. As practitioners, you must therefore follow his example if you are going to take possession of your jitta's greatest and most supreme treasure. But right now, your jitta is completely surrounded by the Gilesas that prevent you from seeing what the real jitta is. All you can see is just the Gilesas. All your thoughts and perceptions are shaped by the Gilesas. Not a single moment are they shaped by the Tamma. When you are overwhelmed by the Gilesas, then all the mental phenomena will be led by the Gilesas because you haven't yet developed any Sati and Banya. To beat the Gilesas, it's therefore imperative for you to seriously and earnestly develop Sati and Banya to overwhelm them. When you continually nurture your sati, it will gradually grow to its full potential. As far as banya is concerned, you mustn't think that it will grow by itself without doing any investigation, regardless of what level of samadhi you might have accomplished. There are many practitioners who believe wrongly that banya will appear automatically following the realization of samadhi, as suggested by some texts. How can this be possible? What I have clearly experienced in my practice was otherwise. How then can I be deceived by this belief? Do you know how many years I was addicted to Samadhi? It got to the point where Dhanadhan Man had to forcefully drive me out of my Samadhi addiction. 
I had to start traversing the path of Banya by probing and investigating with the firm and steady support of Samati that provides the Chitta with ever-present contentment and satisfaction because it was very strong and firm, the highest level of Samati. But did Banya arise automatically from this level of Samati? No, it never happened. I had become so skillful in establishing Samati and stopping all my thoughts that it took me just a few minutes to do it. After the jitta had entered calm, all that remained was this knowingness that I became addicted to and thought it to be Nibbana. I didn't know that there were all sorts of Gilesas still hidden within it, and never thought of it because I didn't have any Banya. But when I began to investigate with Banya, I started to see them and wanted to remove them. I would then keep on investigating until all the Gilesas were eliminated. I could now see the benefits of Banya as it kept on advancing. The more results I achieved, the more I became motivated to investigate. Eventually, I would blame my samadhi addiction for preventing me from advancing in my practice. You should keep in mind that regardless of the samadhi level you might have attained, it won't automatically generate banya. If you don't investigate, banya will never appear. If banya were to arise by itself, then it should have happened to me because I had already developed the highest level of samadhi. But banya didn't appear. If you develop samadhi, you'll only get samadhi. If you want to develop insight, you'll have to investigate. You'll then acquire insight or vipassana, which means clear understanding of the inner nature of all phenomena. You mustn't be complacent and remain idle. You should investigate as soon as you've withdrawn from calm. Each level of calm will support each corresponding level of banya. This is the correct way to practice and it will save you a lot of time. You won't have to worry about whether you're doing it correctly or not because you have me to guide you. All you have to do is follow my advice. Your practice will be easy because you've no doubt in your mind. I've no doubt in my teaching because I have clearly experienced both the path and the fruit. Like when I told you about Satyan Banya relentlessly and ceaselessly investigating to remove the Gilesas with assorted investigation methods to suit the different kinds of Gilesas. From the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep, there wasn't a single moment when I was off my guard. I kept investigating until I went to sleep. This actually happened to me. However, you shouldn't try to duplicate it. This is not the way to practice. You should use it as a guideline. It doesn't have to be identical, but you must more or less adhere to my instruction. What I've told you here is a true story of my uphill struggle in developing my Zati and Banya to their full potential so they can continually investigate to eliminate the Kilesas without ever being off guard. It will be like this when Zati and Banya are fully developed. You've got to work really hard in your quest for enlightenment and the transcendental that are hidden in your jitta to become marvelous and wonderful. But right now it's worthless and filthy because it's being completely covered with the worthless and filthy kilesas. It's therefore imperative to wash them away with your diligent efforts. You should apply all of your banya resources available to you and not solely wait for your teacher's advice. By devising your own investigation methods, your banya resources will never be depleted. Your teacher can only show you how to do it, but you have to adapt it to fit your practice. Then it will be your true and genuine possession. To develop your banya resources, you have to investigate the body's loathsome nature, or a subha. You have to reveal this repulsive nature by going on a gamartana sightseeing trip, investigating repeatedly your body from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, and then back up and down again and again. You should also investigate the skin that wraps around the body. What is being wrapped by this skin? It's a bunch of filth or particula. The skin itself is also filthy. Only the surface of the skin is good enough to look at. Then there is sweat and grime that you have to constantly wash off. You have to continually investigate the body if you want to advance speedily in your practice, because the body is one of your main battlegrounds. Gai Gatasati, with the development of mindfulness of the body, is absolutely necessary as long as the jitta still clings to the body. You've got to keep on investigating with banya until you clearly see the true nature of the body. When you're establishing calm, you shouldn't be concerned with banya. You shouldn't do any thinking at all, but should only be mindful of your meditation subject or theme. You mustn't let the development of calm and banya to get in each other's way. After the jitta has calmed down, rested, and emerged from calm, it's time to investigate with banya without being concerned with samadhi. This is the correct way of practice. 
You should do one task at a time, like directing water to flow through just one channel, because it'll be very efficient. If you're concerned with banya while doing samadhi and vice versa, then you'll be distracted and inefficient. You won't make any progress in your practice if you're not earnest and resolute. When you do walking or sitting meditation to develop calm, you shouldn't be thinking about anything else but your meditation subject. You shouldn't think about the world. The world will not disappear. All there is to this world is just birth and death that piles on top of one another, and has always been so. The affairs of this world are about birth and death, about dissolution and separation. It'll always be like this, so why should you have any concern? The body that you take for a walk, stand up, put to sleep, discharge excrement from, and constantly feed, is changing all the time. It was an infant, now it has grown up. What's this growth really about? It's about anittang, dukkang, and anatta which accompany this growth. There aren't any benefits from the growth of the body, but there are benefits to the growth of your sati and banya. If your sati and banya don't grow, you'll never know how to free yourselves from dukkha. You'll cling to and die with the body. You'll go on endlessly taking up birth, aging, illness, death, and dukkha. If you want to destroy this cycle of rebirths, you'll have to earnestly investigate the nature of the body. If you have to endure dukkha from your practice, let it be. Nobody born into this world can experience only happiness. From birth to death, you'll experience happiness and suffering, whether you're rich or poor, clever or foolish. This body makes no exception for anyone because dukkha is inherent in every body. You've experienced dukkha before, so you shouldn't be discouraged by the dukkha that arises from your exertion. This kind of dukkha is for the supreme result. It's the dukkha of an arya, or a noble one. It's the dukkha for the elimination of the kilesas, for freedom from dukkha, and for the destruction of the cycle of rebirths. No matter how severe this dukkha might be, you're willing to face it. All you need to have are your sati, banya, sadha, and virya battling this dukkha. You mustn't just endure dukkha without doing any investigation, for this will be of no benefit. However much dukkha appears, banya must probe into dukkha to see dukkha as it truly is, that it's just a phenomenon, and to see clearly that the body and the citta, or knowingness, are also phenomena. Sanya, or supposition, arises and ceases. It supposes the body to be I and to be mine. It supposes this feeling to be sukha and that feeling to be dukkha. These are all deceptions. When you've thoroughly investigated and seen it truly, the body will then be just body, ledana just ledana, and the jitta just jitta. You will then have achieved the establishment of the four satipatthana or four foundations of mindfulness. You can also call the four satipatthana the four noble truths or the four ariyasatta. Be serious and really exert yourselves. Don't relent or become discouraged. I have great concern for all of you. That's why I have to constantly teach you Otherwise, your jitta will become slack and dull. You have to arouse your jitta and develop it with the tamma in your practice. If you're drowsy, wash your face or find some other way to overcome your sleepiness, like the ways the practitioners during the time of the Lord Buddha did. What's the purpose of inscribing what they did in the scriptures if it's not for the purpose of teaching you? If you sit meditating and become drowsy, then you should get up and do walking meditation instead. If you're still sleepy, then you should follow the examples of the noble disciples or salakas. One of them walked into the water. After he was knee-deep in the water and still couldn't get rid of his sleepiness, he'd go deeper. And if he was still sleepy, he would soak some grass with water and put it on his head before he could get rid of his drowsiness. He would then investigate until realizing full enlightenment. Listen to that. I think he's already highly attained. But this sleepiness makes no exception of anyone, highly attained or not. That's why he had to devise with his Satyan Banya practical methods to free him from Dukkha and to overcome his drowsiness by walking into the water or placing soaking grass on his head. He must be highly attained because he didn't relent in his exertion. The body, however, felt drowsy and wanted to take a rest. Now consider the case of the Venerable Sona, who exerted himself with walking meditation until his feet became blistered. Because he was so relentlessly and ceaselessly engrossed in investigating with his sati and banya, he completely lost track of time. This wasn't a proper way to practice, being overly obsessed with his investigation. This is uttatta, or restlessness, being so preoccupied with his investigation that it made him forget to take time off to rest in samadhi. 
had he alternated his investigation with resting in samadhi, this would then be the correct way to practice. Like a workman who becomes tired and hungry after a hard day's work, he then takes a rest and feeds himself. The next day he will work some more. It's the same with the jitta. After it is investigated until it becomes exhausted, it has to rest in samadhi or calm, where all activities of the jitta are halted, leaving the jitta with just the knowingness and tranquility. After it is fully rested, the jitta will be strengthened, and after withdrawing from calm it will investigate with banya again. Banya is similar to a knife that has been resharpened, and the workman who has regained his strength from eating and resting. It will now have the strength and sharpness to swiftly destroy the gilesas. The Lord Buddha said that banya developed with the support of samadhi is very powerful. A cook who has all the cooking ingredients ready can cook up any dish he likes. But if he doesn't cook, then those ingredients will remain ingredients. Vegetables will remain vegetables, chilies will remain chilies, and meat will remain meat. How can they become stew? Samadhi will also remain samadhi. It will not become banya automatically if it's not used to support the jitta's investigation. Samadhi can only strengthen the jitta and make it powerful. After the jitta has established samadhi, it will be contented and strong and will be ready to investigate efficiently. Samadhi can't destroy the gilesas, it can only temporarily subdue the gilesas. But samadhi is an indispensable support for the development of banya, because the jitta that has become contented from samadhi can investigate efficiently, and it won't turn into speculation or sanya aramana. When you've eaten your food and rested, you can then work to your fullest capacity. What's it like for you to work when you're hungry? You'll be inefficient and your temper can rise very easily. When you investigate without the support of samadhi, your investigation will go astray, will turn into speculation, and won't produce any result. Samadhi is therefore an indispensable support for the development of banya. The Lord Buddha said that the banya that has been developed with the support of samadhi is very powerful. The jitta that has been developed by banya will definitely be freed from the gilesas. It's only banya that can destroy all the gilesas. Samadhi can't but it plays a very vital supporting role. Sila, Samadhi, and Banya are like staircases. You need Sila to get you to Samadhi, you need Samadhi to get you to Banya, and you need Banya to eliminate all the Gilesas. To be freed from all the Gilesas is the greatest reward. It's the consequence of your fearless exertion and your willingness to sacrifice your life for it. This is the goal that you should aspire to. All the dukkha that you experience in your practice are nourishments that nurture and develop your heart and deliver nibbana to you while you're still alive. You have to be resolute and earnest with your practice. In developing the jitta, you have to follow the Lord Buddha's teaching. You have to be strict with yourselves. Anything that opposes the tamma should be considered to be the gilesas. You have to resist them until they're all destroyed. When you've attained absolute perfection, there won't be any resistance left. After you've purified the jitta, there will be nothing to resist you. You'll see that what has been opposing you were just the gilesas. When your jitta becomes pure, there will be nothing to oppose you. You'll have nothing to push or pull you because you've realized the ultimate freedom from the world. To you, the world doesn't exist, although you're still living in the world with the body that you are no longer attached to. In your jitta, there is just this indescribable knowingness, and only you know very well what it actually is. This knowingness is free from all attachments. Nothing can hurt, oppress, or manipulate it. It exists independently and naturally. What is there to pull and push it? It's only the gilesas that constantly push and pull. You have to eliminate them forcefully. You must not retreat. If you want to be free from dukkha, you mustn't be deterred by the dukkha that arises from your exertion to destroy every kind of gilesa that goes against the tamma. You have to oppose the gilesas because the gilesas oppose the tamma. This is where you have to fight and face the dukkha. This is the dukkha for victory. It's right here. You must not look elsewhere, in this place or at that time. There are only the places and the times of your exertion. But the gilesas that you want to eradicate are inside your jitta. This is where you've got to fight. The Lord Buddha taught you to live in the forest because it's a suitable place for your exertion. But you don't follow his teaching and overlook the gilesas that are oppressing and hurting your jitta. This is wrong. You have to be serious and earnest with your practice. 
after the jitta is freed from all the kilesas, it will be like floating in space, free from the earth's gravitational pull. Floating in the space of the jitta and the space of the tamma is living in this world free from all attachments between the body and the jitta, unlike before when you had to shoulder the burden of your body. This attachment rubadana can really cling and become a very heavy burden for taking the body as I and mine. But after you've investigated and truly realized the body's true nature, you'll let go of the body. You mustn't contradict the tamma teaching because you'll be following the gilesas. No matter how hard and difficult your practice might be, you have got to keep on exerting. You mustn't retreat. Tamma goes this way, so must you. You have to resist the gilesas. Tamma teaches you not to have affection, so you mustn't have affection. If you have any fondness, you have to remove it. You've got to find out its cause and eliminate it. The same with hate. The Tamma doesn't teach you to hate. When the Jitta has reached the middle or natural way, it'll see that both affection and hatred devour the Jitta like the parasitic vines that devour the tree that they grow on and depend on for their nourishment. The nature of the Gilesas is to consume. They will sap the jitta and afflict it with a lot of dukkha. You've got to get rid of them all, then you'll realize perfect bliss. Then it won't matter whether you live or die. Death is just a conventional reality or samadhi, and living is just a string of sense experiences of visible objects, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations that have existed in this world for aeons. They were here long before you were born and will still be here long after you've gone. What can you expect out of them? There's nothing in this world that is really fantastic. If there was anything in this world apart from the tamma that was wonderful, then many people would have already become fantastic and wonderful. But it's not so, because wherever I go, I can only see mountains of dukkha. I can see this very clearly just by observing. The oppression of the gilesas is very severe. They drag you away from the tamma, incite you to defy the tamma, and force you to follow them. If you're weak, then you'll always follow them. Their attraction is very strong. That's why you've got to build up a lot of strength and develop sati and banya to fight them. Whenever they drag you, you must resist with all your might. It can then be said that you're opposing them. If you always follow them, then it can't be said that you're fighting against them because you're being dragged by the nose. You have to keep on opposing them. When they become weakened, the tamma will become stronger. When the kilesas seem to have disappeared, you'll have to search for them with the automatic zade and banya or maha zade and maha banya. When you find them, you'll fight and destroy them and search for more. That's why the jitta at this stage is always busy, because the kilesas of this level are so subtle, they have to be searched for, which is work of the jitta. When it finds the kilesas, it has to fight and destroy them, which is also work for the jitta. The jitta's work will come to an end only when all the gilesas are totally eliminated. This is the work of the gamartana bhikkhu, or the meditating monk. You've got to keep on investigating until you become fully enlightened. Then your work will be accomplished. This is Vositang Brahmadzaryang. You've now accomplished your task. There's nothing more for you to do because all of your attachments have been removed from the jitta. Before this, you're attached to everything from visual objects, sound, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations, to the jitta itself. This is how powerful the kilesas are and how far they will become attached. After you've investigated and removed your attachment to all the visual objects, sound, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations, you're then left with your attachment to the jitta. This attachment or kilesa is avidda that coexists with the jitta. You become inadvertently attached to it because you don't know that this is avidda. Even Sati and Banya of this level can at first be outwitted. You can imagine how subtle this Gelesa is. That's why this avidda has been anointed the ruler of the three realms of existence. You now have to investigate until it's completely eliminated. Then there will be no more attachment left. The Jitta will no longer be attached to the Jitta. If there is still attachment to the jitta, it isn't yet freedom. You're not yet free from avidda. But when avidda has been completely destroyed, then all of your attachments will disappear. You'll then enter into the space of the jitta where you'll never become attached again. You have to destroy all the gilesas before you can enter the space of the jitta, which is comparable to outer space where it's totally devoid of any attracting force. When you do, 
you'll truly understand the nature of the jitta. When there's nothing left inside the jitta, then there will be no attachment to the jitta. The kilesa that causes this attachment is called avidda. It causes the jitta to become attached to itself and become egoistic. After avidda has been destroyed, then the ego will disappear. There will be nothing left to attach to. The jitta will become like outer space devoid of any attracting force. It will live in this world devoid of any attachment for all living beings and the five kanthas, like the body, feelings, perceptions, thoughts, and sense awareness, that appear and disappear as it is their nature to do so. They don't know what they are. The body doesn't know that it's the body. It's the jitta that calls it the body and becomes attached to it. The same with feelings, perceptions, thoughts, and sense awareness. After the jitta's delusion has been removed, it will realize that everything is anitsang, dukkhang, and anatta, and realize that it had been deluded all along. When it sees this truth, it will let go of them, and will become empty like outer space, existing in solitude. This is the solitary existence of this indescribable knowingness. Nobody can describe it correctly, but the one who experiences it knows what it is, and knows it's impossible to describe it. You've got to practice hard, the svakata, or well-taught tamma, is genuine and fresh. It's the middle way of practice, madhima bhadibhada, that's very suitable for the eradication of all kinds of kilesas at all times.